Hello, everyone. Welcome to Hacking Photosynthesis. My name is Laura Wood Peterson, and I am here today representing the National Coalition for Food and Agricultural Research. We thank you for joining us. It's in CFAR's mission to bring together food, ag, nutrition, conservation, and natural resource stakeholders to support increasing federal funding in food and agricultural research, extension, and education. We would like to thank the Council on Food, Agriculture, and Resource Economics for their technical assistance with this event. This event would not be possible without support from the American Society of Plant Biologists, the American Society of Agronomy, the Crop Science Society of America, and the Soil Science Society of America, and the American Seed Trade Association. NCFAR covers a diversity of topics in research areas. Today, our guests are talking about cutting edge research and how we think about maximizing possibilities in photosynthesis to achieve increases in crop production without using additional resources. Now let's talk about our panel. Dr. Charlie Messina is a distinguished fellow at Corteva AgriScience. Dr. Lisa Ainsworth is the research leader of the Global Change and Photosynthesis Research Unit at the USDA's Agricultural Research Service. And here every, is everyone you'll be hearing from today, including our moderator, Carl Anderson, Director of Government Affairs with the American Society of Agronomy. Now I'll hand this webinar over to Dr. Charlie Messina, who will start us off. So thanks very much for the opportunity. Uh... To, to share uh, what we learn in Corteva AgriScience and our thoughts about how can we work with distinguished scientists like Lisa on continue improving uh, crops and with focus in, in maize in this particular talk. So be, before we uh, start talking about uh, how photosynthesis contributed to crop improvement, I would like to bring to your attention to this slide put uh, for by NASA. Uh, this is about fluorescence. Uh, what is striking is that in the Midwest, this fluorescent peak that levels 40% greater than the Amazon. Uh, to, to me, given the fluorescence is related to photosynthesis, it's immediate the question who uh, or what crops are contributing to uh, such increase in, in, in carbon fixation. And I can use some help from NASA to line up uh, some of the maps, but what you can see there, that is in those highest uh, photosynthesis uh, uh, peaks, uh, coincide very well with the corn acres that are grown in the US. So essentially, it, it immediately uh, 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 forced the, 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 the thought and the image that we have a pretty much a second Amazon, at least for part of the year, in the United States. And now that we sort of tie this high productivity to, to corn, I think is, uh, is appropriate to now start looking into how photosynthesis might have contributed to that. So the first question we need to ask is how hill improvement change with time? So before we connect and ask the question, how photosynthesis contribute to that trend? So here, uh, what I'm showing is a chart where we plot year of commercialization. Each point is a hybrid selected by growers. This is the era uh, set that Don Dubik start uh, experimenting in 1990s. And the y-axis is, is grain yield. And you can see that regardless of the high or low plant population, the trends are being positive and yields pretty much double or more from 75 to 225 bushels and the high plant populations over a century of breeding. So selection occurred for yield and standability. The first double crosses were focused on uh, enabling or take advantage of mechanization, uh, realizing the opportunities for fertilization and irrigation using single crosses, the biotech era in the 2000s, and more recently with Aquamax germoplasm is about enabling and activating circularity by producing more with the same or less resources. So you can see there are different uh, breeding objectives here. So the question is how photosynthesis contribute in one or more of these decades. And to do that before 
uh, we, we get into the experiment and result. What I would like to do is use this simple causal, causal diagram that relates that plant architecture to light use efficiency, to mass, to yield. And there's some other factors, of course, contributing to yield. What I would like to, like, like to do is bring to your attention to this light use efficiency, which essentially is the production of mass. You can see on the y-axis. Uh, in relation to the intercept solar radiation, you can see little suns there in pink. Plants use red and blue light. Pink probably is the right uh, color, so Lisa doesn't fuss at me. And the slope of these two, uh, let's say, hybrids, one, let's say, modern, one old, is the hypothesis, is that for the same level of intercept radiation, the one hybrid will produce more for uh, that level of resource. So with um, that definition in place, what we can do now is start looking into what we found in terms of this light use efficiency. The rationale for looking at light use efficiency, not something else, is because of the changes in cano canopy architectures. If you look at the, the images on, on the top, you can see the 30s, these hybrids that have floppy leaves, in the 90s, the leaves become more erect. Think about the leaf level uh, photosynthesis is follows a, a function of limit of diminishing returns. So floppy leaves, essentially what they're doing is uh, operating at the saturation level and shading the, plant, the, the leaves lower in the canopy. So they are, they are not producing as efficient as it could be. On the right, you can see Another picture from inside the canopy that uh, is more obvious how these leaves are more floppy and self-shading relative to the more erect leaves that let the light penetrate through the canopy. So to test that hypothesis, what we did is run a number of experiments over about five years. I think here we are looking at the efficiency, this light use efficiency, this mass relative to intercepted light. That's what you see on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, instead of plotting, is the year of commercialization. So uh, you can compare these positive trends that you can see in this figure in experiments conducted in Chile and the United States and the really good conditions. Uh, and each point is a hybrid the same way we plot the yield. So now we have positive trends for yield and light use efficiency. When we do a combined analysis of all these experiments, um, these are mass harvested in, in plots with replication. These are not estimation, these are real uh, measurement. What we see is that the, the, the trends in these conversion efficiencies of light into mass is about 0.3% a year, which is uh, looks pretty low, uh, probably disappointedly low if you look at that number, but when you multiply that over 100 years of breeding, adds up to 30% improvement to light use efficiency. So if we go back to our left and think about this causal diagram, in uh, most of the environments in the corn belt where water deficiencies are present, but they are not as determined as the semi-arid regions, light use efficiency contribute virtually linearly to the production of mass and given the harvest index, let's assume that we choose the right management is a constant that translates linearly to yield. So if we do that, and this is a number for policymakers to remember, it's an approximate number, we can refine it, but I think about one third of that yield improvement, that doubling the yield can be attributed to yield improvement to the photosynthesis through improvement in the light use efficiency. Now, if we take everything constant, management, uh, irrigation, nutrition, plant density, and the right agronomics, think about that, about that doubling of, of class of yields, about 30% is due to photosynthesis. That is about equivalent to one fifth of the US, uh, US maize production. It will take one sixth, one fifth, but that's about the ballpark estimate of how photosynthesis and the investment in research from the old days in Cornell of Emerson to modern uh, in, uh, uh, research at Dillino and Cornell with Buckler and Lisa, 
uh, that's what he's uh, translating into. Of course, there's a massive investment in the private industry to drive uh, yields and selection for it. So with that, uh, what I would like to do now is uh, bring to your attention that things are not that straightforward. It's not just a matter of selecting for e photosynthesis and things are going to happen. So I want to show you simply this uh, chart, um, focus on that WD1 and D2 on the x-axis, that's a water deficit. Essentially the hypothesis is that harvest index, it changes with cycles of selection. So what we did is put, uh, push these uh, double crosses, the old hybrids as I showed in the first slide, and the single crosses, the modern hybrids to increasing water deficit, and you can see the reduction in yield plotting in the um, y-axis. So then the, the question is why that yield um, uh, reduction occurred, and essentially look at the uh, the figure on the left, the upper picture, with those barren, essentially you can see the cobs. Essentially the old hybrids have more of the barren cobs and less of the cobs with grains. They also have more uh, cobs with that scatter grain, those uh, like popcorn grains, but the modern hybrids don't and both have a lower number of commas per year. So essentially the difference between the two is in one case, the old hybrids, they crash and the stress conditions, whether you put more plants, water deficit, low light, low nitrogen, while the modern hybrids can withstand that much uh, better. So that take us to how photosynthesis contribute to grain yield is an iteratively interplay between breeding and agronomy. So how this works, breeders selected for yield, and essentially improve the reproductive efficiency. They've been pushing the crops to maintain and have more plants with ears with grain and less uh, barren plants. So agronomists figure that out, they increase the plant density and breeders now can start selecting for traits like uh, um, the canopy architecture or root architecture to adapt to these crowded conditions. Higher photosynthesis can improve uh, the reproductive success and agronomists put more plants and this cycle went on and on over the cycles of selection over the last hundred years. So essentially it's a little bit more complicated than one thing at a time. So how do we harness that we know about this iterative process and we know about photosynthesis, how we can accelerate that in crop improvement? And part of the answer is through predictive breeding and technology. So one of the things that we are putting together is using machine learning and image analysis to look at kernel numbers in those years. So we want years with kernels and less barren. Uh, growers and um, breeders can utilize high resolution images to estimate as NASA estimated fluorescence to estimate photosynthesis. We can use robotics to count the plants. As you see, there's an important component of that yield improvement. And we can put all the things together using artificial intelligence. Here is a Bayesian network connected with the mechanistic model. So let me show you a simple example of how we went about. So the first thing to uh, make improvement for photosynthesis is we need to have the basic ingredient, which is genetic variation for light use efficiency. And we measured that with our Aquamax germplasm. And you can see here that the histograms suggest that we have about the variation we see from the old and the new hybrids, even a little bit higher to 2.5. However, we don't have a whole lot more than that. So there is genetic variation the grower can use. As I said, it's not just easier selecting the higher IUE, but in some cases uh, we can identify material that is the case. So that's where we put everything in action and connect it these mathematical models where we can estimate the photosynthesis from the different leaves in different places over the growing season. You can see that animation. We use molecular markers to estimate the characteristics of the IUE. And in the end, in these particular four, plant, four breeding populations, you can see there's differences in light use efficiency, each color and cloud of points. You can see on the x-axis from 1.9 to 2.1 
So the difference between populations and individuals, which is each point is a hybrid within the population. So readers can select for yield and highlight use efficiency as a way to drive it forward. So this is uh, uh, one approach. Carl will ask, so what? Well, the, in the end, what we can do by selecting for higher photosynthesis is to produce more with less water or the same amount of water, more grain with the same nitrogen and produce more with less land. And this is the same figure I showed you at the beginning, but when these trends are present in the in, the water deficit and the nitrogen deficit and the irrigation conditions. Now, if we look at what, uh, what was the impact globally, we did a cluster analysis. You can see the US, Canada, and Europe. These are the more developed economies uh, where the investment has been in, agri in agricultural research the highest. You can see that yields went from about three tons to about 10, which is uh, uh, the largest increase in, uh, in the world. In other temperate areas, it's lagging behind, but interestingly, the general plasma is being shared, and therefore part of that trend we see in those developer economies are a result of sharing general plasma from the uh, Midwest. And similar things you can see in the Brazil and less in, in Africa. So what are the, the um, take home messages uh, is um, photosynthesis play and continue to play the critical role improving uh, in crop improvement. The, we have tools now that uh, we can utilize to integrate knowledge and further drive crop improvement. Uh, things are a bit more complicated and it will be take some iterative learning on how to do things. And to me, the, the key question is how we can accelerate and shorten that 100 years of uh, improving photosynthesis in a much shorter timeline by harnessing some of the knowledge that Lisa is creating in her program, how we can integrate that knowledge to accelerate uh, production for yield. And I think uh, now the, the, the interesting part of the talk with Lisa um, start. So thank you very much. Pass on to you, Lisa. Okay, great. All right. Well, it's a it's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about um, hacking photosynthesis. Um, and so, why can we do this now? Why improve photosynthesis now? And so, probably many of you don't think about photosynthesis every day. Um, and Charlie already reminded you, but I'll do it again. That photosynthesis is the process by which leaves harvest energy from the sun and convert it into sugars um, and release oxygen for us to breathe, but also provide all of the food and the fiber and much of the fuel that we use today. So the, the photosynthetic process is now known in tremendous detail, largely from investments that were made in fundamental research. And so scientists study photosynthesis at scales from individual atoms to the globe. And Charlie showed a picture of, of, flu of fluorescence in the Midwest, which is basically a measure of how much photosynthesis is happening in the Midwest. And so why do we think we can improve photosynthesis in crops? Well, there, there are a number of reasons. And one is that the proteins and the enzymes that plants use to harvest solar energy and to convert carbon dioxide into sugars are largely conserved across species. And so if we know something about one species, we can translate that information into another. Um, also, the detailed understanding of the photosynthetic reactions enables us to model the process um, computationally um, in a way that we couldn't 15 years ago or 20 years ago. And so by using high performance computing and, and modeling, we can test what would happen if we alter the amount of different proteins or the activity of different enzymes and how that might affect photosynthesis and ultimately crop yield. Um, we can then use those computational models to identify targets to improve photosynthesis. Uh, and because crop transformation is getting more efficient and more routine, we can then test those targets in plants. And so 
Again, you might wonder, what does photosynthesis have to do with crop yields? And Charlie explained this nicely, but there's another way to think about it, and that is just that yield, which is in this equation here as y, is really a function of a few different efficiencies. And so yield is a product of how much total solar radiation um, a, a canopy of crops absorbs. And so this is basically all the leaves within a field. How much light did they absorb? And, and um, the, the sun puts out you know, many wavelengths of light and plants can use almost 50% of that light. The other 50% they just can't use. And so that's that 48.7% that you see there. And then yield is determined by how efficiently plants can intercept that light um, and how efficiently plants convert the light, the energy that's um, intercepted from, from the sun into carbohydrates. So that's the conversion efficiency. And then how efficiently plants put all of that energy into the part of the plant that we want, which is the seed. And so that's the partitioning efficiency or harvest index, with, with, which Charlie talked about as well. And so those are kind of, this is a really simple equation that, that theoretically provides an explanation for how yield is formed in crops. And so if we look at how well plants and crops were doing this before the Green Revolution, what we know is that, the, that um, we can measure sort of what the theoretical maximum of each of these efficiencies is. And so before the Green Revolution, the, the, the ability for crops to intercept light and use that um, in, um, or light interception efficiency was maybe half of its theoretical maximum. Uh, additionally, the, the ability of crops to partition energy into the seeds or the parts of the plants that we eat and use was about 50%. And conversion efficiency was maybe 25 to 30% of the theoretical maximum. And so then with the Green Revolution, breeders introduced genes that enabled crops to increase their harvest index and use fertilizer and, and remain standing up in the field. And so both interception efficiency and partitioning efficiency increased um, very close to now their theoretical maximum. But conversion efficiency, which is largely driven by how much photosynthesis occurs, was not changed very much with the Green Revolution, and it, and it still remains well below the theoretical maximum. And so this is really some of the justification for why photosynthesis is, is a major target, remains a major target for increasing crop yield. And so there are many targets for improving photosynthesis, and I'll talk about some of them today, but just to remind you that carbon dioxide, in order for photosynthesis to occur, you need a couple of things. You need, the, the leaf needs to absorb light from the sun, and you have to have carbon dioxide diffuse through small pores on the leaf surface that are called stomata, um, and then diffuse into uh, the, the plastid of the leaf, the chloroplast, um, and then that's where the enzymes are that fix the CO2. And so there, there's a lot of research going on at really every scale to improve photosynthesis. And so currently the Department of Energy is funding research that's testing if you can alter the density of the pores on the leaf surface. And that's what, um, sorry, the, the image that you see there sort of in red and yellow is showing you um, a, an image of the leaf surface. And so scientists are, um, are, are using genetic modifications to change the density of the stomata and see if that affects photosynthesis. Um, also, the key enzyme that's involved in fixing carbon dioxide, and that's shown in the black box there with, the, with um, a model of this enzyme, um, it's called Rubisco, and it often misfires, and instead of fixing carbon dioxide, it reacts with oxygen. Um, so there's a lot of research to improve that enzyme and to improve the enzymes that activate Rubisco. And also the light environment in which crops are growing is constantly changing. And so plants produce proteins that act kind of like sunscreen. And sometimes they produce too much and sometimes they have too little. And so optimizing the production of those pigments is also a key target for improving photosynthesis. And so I'm part of a research project that's called RIPE, and that stands for Realizing Improved Photosynthetic Efficiency. And this is a research project that's led by the University of Illinois, by my colleagues there, and it's funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And the aim of the work is to test a number of different targets to improve photosynthesis in crops, and thereby increase crop yield. Um, and so in the next few slides, I'd just like to run through a couple of these different targets that have already seen success in field trials. 
So the first one is a target called relaxing photoprotection, and I'll just explain that in a little bit of detail here. So when leaves are exposed to high light, there's more light um, that's incumbent upon the leaf than the plants can really use in photosynthesis. And so they have to dissipate or get rid of all of that excess energy as heat. And this is, they do that through a process called non-photochemical quenching, and I'll just, I'll just abbreviate that as NPQ. And so the expression of different pigments in the leaf, um, and, 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 and those are shown in the, in the diagram uh, to the left of the slide, the expression of these different pigments determines how much heat is dissipated. And so when plants transition from a highlight condition when there's lots of sun to maybe a cloudy condition where there's too little sun, what's happening is that the plants then have low rates of photosynthesis because they're investing in this heat dissipation. Um, and it can take minutes to hours really for plants to transition and so that they dissipate less heat and do more photosynthesis. Um, and the, the content of different pigments is associated with this pro process. And so I like to think of this as analogous to transition lenses if you've ever worn transition lens um, glasses. So transition lenses are clear um, under kind of dark conditions, right? And then if you go out into the sun with your transition lenses, they darken to protect your eyes from high light. But if you rapidly walk from a very sunny situation into say a dark hallway, it takes a while before you can see because the lenses stay dark. Um, and so what we're trying to do in plants is sort of um, accelerate sort of this transition from a protective state where lenses are dark to a state where lenses are um, letting more light through. And so this is one of the targets. And my colleagues at the University of Illinois and UC Berkeley designed a transgenic strategy to make NPQ relax more quickly so that a plant can have higher rates of photosynthesis when light fluctuates from high to low. And, and this occurs naturally um, um, when there's, say, wind right through the canopy that moves leaves around or when a cloud passes over during the day. And so specifically what they did is shown um, in, in the text under this figure, but I'll just show you um, what happened. So this slide shows the approach. And so basically they transformed tobacco with agrobacterium, and, and, and that's just a, a way to insert genes that control the speed and also the amplitude of MPQ. And so the, the, the circle at the top of the slide on the top left shows the plasmid map of which specific genes were modified. And on the right, you can see the mRNA expression. So that's just the, the message RNA, and you can see that it's increased, and that's, that's shown in red there in that, in that um, image. And then the level of the proteins that's changed is shown in, um, to the right. And so um, you can see that both the expression of the genes and the amount of proteins was increased. Um, and the red bars are actually showing you that the transgenes in tobacco came from the model species Arabidopsis. And so this work was done with tobacco because tobacco is easy to genetically transform using agrobacterium, um, and it grows really rapidly and produces a lot of seeds. So it's a good model plant. It's kind of like the fruit fly of plant science research. And so when this transformation was made, the plants grew bigger, and that's what you're seeing in this picture. So WT stands for wild type, and that's plants that don't contain the altered expression of the MPQ enzymes. And then numbers 56, 23, and 34 show you the transgenic plants. And so these were grown in a greenhouse, and they're obviously bigger there. Um, and the next step was to grow them out in the field and field trials, and that's what's shown in this image here. And so D shows you the, the field trials. And then A and B and C are showing you that the dry weight of those transgenic plants was about 25% greater. They had more leaf area and the plants were taller. And so the next step of this research is to transgenically modify, modify crops and trials with soybean are, are currently underway. So um, that was one success. A second strategy to improve photosynthesis is to bypass a process called photorespiration. And so I mentioned that the enzyme that um, fixes carbon dioxide into sugars can't really distinguish very well between carbon dioxide and oxygen. And so about 25% of the time, this enzyme misfires and it catalyzes a reaction with oxygen. 
So this leads to the production of a compound that is actually toxic to plants, and it has to be recycled in a process called photorespiration. And plants expend a tremendous amount of energy recycling that toxic compound, and in fact, it's estimated that photorespiration um, decreases soybean and, and wheat yields by 148 trillion calories per year. And so I just want to take a minute to point out that the discovery that Rubisco fixes oxygen as well as CO2 was made by Dr. Bill Ogren, um, and he was a USDA ARS scientist at the time in Urbana, Illinois, where I am right now. And he made that discovery about 50 years ago. And he was also the first research leader in the photosynthesis research unit, and now the second research leader, Professor Don Ort, who's at the University of Illinois, is leading the work that I'm going to talk about right now, which is trying to bypass this sort of wasteful um, process of photorespiration. And so me, for, for me, this is just a really tremendous example of the importance of investing in fundamental research, because the discovery that was made 50 years ago is now leading to transgenic plants today that have improved rates of photosynthesis. And so what is Don Ort doing to bypass the process? Um, in fact, he and his group are inserting a, a new biochemical pathway. And so just in this diagram, everything that's in red basically doesn't exist in plants. Um, and so they've borrowed genes from bacteria and other organisms to recycle um, the toxic product, which is glycolate. It has two carbons. That's why it's called C2 here within the chloroplast. And, and, and it's called a bypass because we're trying to bypass using peroxisome, which is another sort of compartment in the cell and the mitochondria to recycle um, this two carbon molecule. The other thing that, that, um, that Don Orr and his group are doing is they're knocking down this transporter that exists in the membrane of the chloroplast. And so they're, not, they're doing that so that less glycolate leaves the chloroplast and remains in, um, inside the chloroplast to be recycled. And so, again, this work was all done in tobacco, and they um, transformed a number of plants, both with and without knocking down that transporter. And what they found is that there was about um, up to a 30% increase in biomass in these plants that had this um, bypass of, of the photorespiration process in the field. They, had, um, they also had greater total starch, which is shown here in, in different properties of photosynthesis. And so I just um, want to point out that the research to improve photosynthesis and crop yield is, is maybe not what most people assume agricultural research looks like. And so Charlie made this point as well. But the effort to improve photosynthesis takes expertise in computer science, biological modeling, molecular biology, plant physiology, um, and field trials. And so this, this maybe isn't, isn't American Gothic, right? It's multidisciplinary. It's collaborative science. It's enabled by decades of investment in fundamental science. And so the, 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 the pipeline for the right project is to develop these computer mo models and to use those to simulate um, um, plants growing in the field, to identify targets for photosynthetic improvement, to test those then in model crops, and then to take the successes and put those actually into crops that we want to, uh, that contribute to food security uh, um, today and into the future. And so um, just, just to summarize, the scientific and technological advancements that have been done have enabled rapid testing of potential targets to improve photosynthesis in crops. And, and um, I think one thing that's important to keep in mind that Charlie also mentioned is that um, we need to think about both today's atmosphere and tomorrow's atmosphere and climate because they're changing very rapidly. And the targets that we identify to today will also change in the future. Um, and so I just want to end with a slide that gives you an idea of the mission of the Wright Project. And so the mission of the project is to end hunger worldwide by improving the process of photosynthesis to increase crop production. And the aspiration of that is that by equipping farmers with higher yielding crops, we can ensure that everyone has enough food to lead a healthy and productive life. So... Um, the, the project is, as I mentioned before, um, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research and also the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And um, it's, it's done in partnership with a number of universities. And so 
thank you very much and I'm, I'm happy to take questions now. Uh, I just want to remind people that if you have questions to please uh, put them in the uh, in the question box and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Uh, we have a few that have come in I just I want to start with I think uh, to begin with I think one of the, the big questions is, is how far away are we from the commercialization of, of crops that are more uh, photosynthetic uh, efficient is uh, I think one of the one of the main questions is is this is all very promising and how far away are we from from having these in the field? So Charlie, I don't know if you want to take that. I mean, I guess I think Charlie's already shown us that maize is already more photosynthetically efficient. <laughs> You know, breeders have already done a really good job at changing the canopy architecture in maize so that those leaves at the top are more vertical, more light gets through to the canopy, and they have higher light use efficiency. Uh, in terms of the of of the um, strategies that I just mentioned, um, some of them we're already testing in soybean, and so if those trials go well, then you know I think we're maybe a handful of years away from seeing this. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to add and emphasize my, my talk was to, to show that a lot of this research actually can happen, right? Uh, photosynthesis is tied to increase in yield. So accelerate, how we can use all the science that Lisa is doing, whether it's uh, whether gene editing or some friendly uh, transformation can lead to better product. Uh, Corteva um, it, it published in, in PNAS uh, a recent paper that is being tested that it has uh, some increased level of photosynthesis. It's not the biochemical. I, uh, my understanding is more about the nitrogen concentration canopy size. Uh, it's, it's probably it's a different way to get to uh, increase photosynthesis, but things are coming through a pipeline. So it's it's not that we need to wait another 50 years. There, there are some things that are close to that, uh, close to the grow, right? And another thing we need to think about is about regulatory uh, frameworks and, and how uh, we, we can make things a little bit easier for the, the science to be translated into solutions to the farmers. Um, anyways, I'm, I'm not the expert in that area, but I'm passing the message. <laughs> Yeah, well, thinking of that translation piece, I know Charlie, you 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 talked about maize, and I know Lisa, you mentioned some work in in soybeans. Are there other crops where there's a lot of promise for this uh, technology? Absolutely. I mean, the some of the key crops that we're focusing on are crops that are important in sub-Saharan Africa, and so cassava is a target crop. Um, cowpea, um, which in the south in the U.S. we know as black-eyed peas, that's another target crop. Um, the photorespiratory bypass is being tested in potato right now, and so I think there are, are a number of crops, and because the process of photosynthesis is largely conserved, you know, I think that really the sky's the limit. Charlie, do you have anything to add to that? I, I agree that uh, given it's conserved, uh, it should work in C3s <laughs> for the concentration mechanism. So, um, and certainly architecture probably on the C4, but the, the photochemical quenching I think is really intriguing. I would die to see uh, how that plays in, in C4s. Yeah, you know, Lisa, this question is specifically to you, and it's how much of this genetic modification leading to overall biomass yield is scalable to grain yield? Right, and so that is, you know, that's what we're testing right now. And so um, I think that if the changes don't affect the harvest index, right, so this is the proportion of the energy that's actually put into the seed, then it should be scalable. 
Um, and I think that this is this is these are the experiments that are happening right now. There is always a there is always sort of a loss of energy as you go from one tissue to another, or you know if you think of a about a molecule of carbon dioxide coming in and being fixed by photosynthesis, right? There's you have to turn that into sugars, and just the process of turning something into sugars, you're gonna lose a little bit of the efficiency. And then when you have to move that carbohydrate from the leaf to the pod, there's going to be energy that the plant needs to use to do that as well. And so um, I think, you know, in the, the uh, preliminary experiments with tobacco that were done in controlled environments where they could actually produce the seeds, they saw, you know, about a 15% increase in yield. And I think that the, you know, the hope is that that will be similar in the food crops that they test. And another, you know, question about uh, about the technology, you know, the research you're doing is how would how do these improvements interact with plant susceptibility to disease? Is that something that you've looked at? Um, no, but I can say in field trials where we're doing all of these experiments, these plants are out there in the field, and so they are, um, you know, they they uh, are being grown in a natural environment where we will see disease. So one of the other things that we've done at, um, here in in Illinois, and this is work that's been done both by USDA and the University of Illinois, is to grow crops under concentrations of elevated carbon dioxide. And so um, we're, we're rapidly increasing the carbon dioxide concentration in our atmosphere. Um, and so understanding how plants respond to that is, is also timely and, and needed. And so some of the changes that we're proposing to photosynthesis um, essentially do the same thing. They're kind of increasing um, the efficiency by which rubisco, the rubisco enzyme fixes CO2. And what we know um, in elevated CO2 is that there, there tend to be more sugars in the leaves, and so some insects and some, you know, some pests will then feed more on those leaves because sugars are a stimulant for, for pests to feed, and also because the pest needs to eat more to get the same amount of nitrogen. And so there have been some experiments that have shown that, that um, there's the potential for more herbivory by pests. Um, but I think, you know, until we until we do more trials, we don't really know the answer to that. We just have these sort of other um, other sorts of information to make a best guess. The uh, one of the things, you know, you talked about, uh, Lisa, you talked about the Green Revolution, and and I think one one thing that. Uh, People have been thinking about is is what role these new technologies like hacking photosynthesis play in the next green revolution, and then what what else will be needed to ensure that we have a resilient food system uh, and food security and, and you know in a changing climate and and limited resources. And really, that's a question for for both of you. Yeah, I mean, I think I think photosynthesis has the potential to play a role in the next green revolution. But as you just said, Carl, I, I think that the next green, green revolution has to be um, much greener than the last green revolution. So sustainability is absolutely critical um, as as um, you know, as we have more people on the planet and resources are, you know, there's a limit to how much resource we can use. Additionally, I think that adaptation to a more stressful growing environment is going to play a very important role in, in the next green revolution. Um, you know, the temperatures that we're seeing out west <laughs> this year and in Canada this year are just sort of a harbinger of what future growing seasons are going to look like. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, having plants that use less water and that are adapted to higher temperatures and more stressful growing seasons is gonna be in, incredibly important to maintaining the food supply that we have today. Yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, the next green revolution will have to be greener, as Lisa said, <laughs> and um, 
I, I show the, the first image as agricultural photosynthesis as a way to combat climate change to, to, to a large extent. So if we can boost photosynthesis, that's more CO2 that's going to go to the plant. And well, the complexities on how we are going to keep it uh, going back to the atmosphere, but that certainly is a, is a thing that we should consider as part of that next revolution. I think it's part of nutrition. Is about is about that uh, minimizing the waste, which bring us straight to my kind of a hidden message in circularity. I think part of the the next green revolution will be grounding in that circularity and what sort of breathing do we need to do to enable that. Um, and I think photosynthesis at the core essentially we need to get rid of that CO2. The plant has the yeah. solar panels, right? <laughs> and the machinery to do it. We, need to, we don't need to reinvent that. You know, building on that, uh, you know, someone asked a question, are you, are you actually modeling the impact of, of these new crops on environmental resource efficiency in the field? So you mentioned water and, and fertilizer. Uh, is, that part of the, is that part of the modeling? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and a part of the modeling, and also want to refer to the last uh, image I showed that uh, all throughout the hundred years of breeding, we have evidence that that is the case, right? So this is not a, a promise that is going to happen. If, if we can continue making this genetic gain and photosynthesis as part of it, we can put things on the ground, it's repeatable with this era hybrid. You apply the same amount of water, you get more yield. Same amount of nitrogen, you get more yield. Uh, and of course, the other way of looking at it is you can use less land to produce the same. So uh, th this is not a, a, a hopeful, <laughs> it's not a, um, something we wish for, is is building of that legacy of what we know that that is actually a reality. You know, kind of uh, zooming out a little bit beyond just the, your work on photosynthesis, you know, you both talked about all the modern technologies you're using in, in research. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the questions is, is just what, what is the future of agriculture research? Uh, and, and why would you encourage, uh, you know, young, young people to go into agriculture research? Because it, it seems to me, you know, listening to you, it's such a cutting edge area and sometimes it's not portrayed that way. And yet you're, you're working with really cutting edge technology to, to do your research. Who, who wants to, who wants to tackle, tackle that first? I can, I mean, I can go first. I think, you know, I did want to make the point that 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 to produce a transgenic plant takes advances in everything from computer science to biochemistry to molecular biology to agronomy, right? And 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 we don't normally think about that, but I think that you know there there is new there there are new um, centers for um, artificial intelligence that are being funded right now by the National Science Foundation and by NIFA. And there's one in agriculture because we're using, we're using, you know, we're using everything from AI and machine learning, you know, to, to very um, advanced sensors. And we're studying photosynthesis quite literally from atoms to the globe with some of the satellites that, that measure fluorescence today. And so, I guess, why would you want to go into this field? Well, number one, there's tremendous opportunity across all of those scales. Number two, you know, we all eat, right? And food is an important part of our culture. Um, it's an important part of, of you know, how you, how, you, how you interact with everybody um, that you meet. Um, and, and also, I think that agriculture is, has, has been, um, uh, agriculture has the potential to really be a solution in terms of some of the greatest challenges to our planet. And so, you know, as we talk about climate change and the changes in the atmospheric environment, 
you know, ag agriculture has contributed quite a bit to that, but it has now the potential, you know, to be a solution, as Charlie mentioned. If we can improve photosynthesis and we can lock carbon away underground and roots or use it, um, use it to produce, use the recent photosynthesis to produce the myriad products that we use every day, then agriculture has a tremendous, you know, has tremendous potential to be a solution. My, my bit short answer, I think uh, Lisa provided the details about the AI and the engineering and the complex systems. Uh, I think we, we're thinking about that circular economy. There's so much, so many opportunities to apply uh, mathematical science and cutting edge engineering in agriculture. Uh, and it has, uh, to me, producing food and increasing food security and improving the lives of those who produce and consume it, it has also, uh, at least wor by working in Corteva, that's that's kind of uh, rewarding that every day you know that by increasing those yields up a little bit, someone else is going to eat. So it's less hunger around the world. So why ag research? Well, that there's a... <laughs> That's a very strong motivation. And on the other side, you, you are using very uh, uh, advanced mathematics and engineering to do it. It's, it's no longer uh, uh, walking plots as it used to be. Well, I think that's a great place to wrap up. Uh, very, very strong, I think, closing comments from both of you about the potential of, of agriculture and the importance of research to, to get us there and find the solutions. And I, I just want to thank, uh, you know, Dr. Lisa Ainsworth and Dr. Charlie Messina again for uh, your excellent presentations. Uh, it's been, I think, a really uh, eye-opening uh, presentation for, for all of us uh, about the future of agriculture and the, and the promise uh, of, of new technologies. And, and again, I just I want to thank uh, our partners who helped make this happen, uh, the uh, American Society of Plant Biologists, uh, the American Seed Trade Association, the American Society of Agronomy, the Crop Science Society of America, uh, and the Soil Science Society of America. And then of course, uh, NCFAR, the National Coalition for Food and Agriculture Research. Uh, and I just wanna end with a special thanks for from CFAIR who, who hosted the, the webinar and, and helped with all the logistics. So thank you again for, for all of the support and uh, thank you for tuning in today.